we are going to be talking about humility this morning. Yeah, that's right, Timothy. But I, I just, uh, once again, a reminder that coming up the weekend of April the 19th and 21st are two special, very important days in the life of our church and the life of all Christians is the day on which we commemorate the death of Jesus, the, the crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday, and then the Resurrection Sunday, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus and the, and therefore the hope that we have. So I, I want to remind you uh, and say that the Friday night will be definitely a time uh, of contemplation, a time of, of uh, it'll be a, a meaningful night, and you're more than welcome to come and join us. Each and every one of you will have either in the back room or here in the sanctuary, and we'll partake of the bread and the cup in the context of that Passover meal, which was his last supper. But then on the Sunday, we're going to be celebrating. It's going to be a celebration day. In fact, I want that first uh, day, that day to be the first sermon of a new sermon series called A Sound Mind. And I really hope that you're excited about this and you'll invite your friends, invite people who need to hear uh, about the fact that the scripture and that God calls on us to have a sound mind and gives us the ability to have a sound mind. If you deal with anxiety or stress or anything like that, or just the disorganization of life, that's going to be a sermon series for you. And if you know anybody that could benefit from it, invite them to come out. Because each and every week is going to be a practical sort of exploration of what the Bible says and what, what just wisdom has to say about how we can have order and mind and soundness of mind. So we can't control the world out there, right? That's, that's very tough to control the world out there, but we can control the, the, our world in here, if you will, and our, our homes and our families, right? There can be order from chaos, and that's what I'm going to be preaching about starting on April 21st. Now, that weekend of Easter weekend, uh, it also begins the holiday of Passover, and so it's a special time when all of God's people, both Christians and even traditional Jewish people, are celebrating the salvation of God. Of course, traditional Jewish people are celebrating the salvation that God accomplished for for them, uh, rescuing them out of Egypt, rescuing them from slavery, Whereas we are celebrating that as well, but we're also celebrating the greater salvation, the greater exodus from Egypt, uh, the, that is the greater exodus from sin and death that we have in our Lord Jesus the Messiah. So it's going to be an important weekend, and I, and I encourage you to be there that weekend, both events, especially especially the Sunday. We want that Sunday to be a huge success and a great way to launch into the summer. But here's the thing. So we know that Jesus died on the cross. That's what we've been looking at these past few weeks. We've been looking at the fact that the king has been crucified. But we all know that 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 story does not end with his death. In fact, that's just part one. Part two is the resurrection of Jesus. God raising Jesus from the dead. Without that, it makes the story, like without the resurrection, the death means nothing, right? There might be some inspiration in it, but it's really the fact that God raised him from the dead and vindicated Jesus and demonstrated that he is everything he said he was. It, it, that's what makes the story relevant, right? It's, it's, they're both needed because the cross is then connected to the resurrection. Without the cross, you can't have the resurrection. But without the resurrection, you can't have the fulfillment of God's promises, the kingdom of God. So it's all connected, and that's what we've been looking at. So I want to just remind you of some of the reasons why we believe in the cross, the significance of the cross. This is just a reminder. We've, we've covered a lot of this already. But the first thing is that we believe, firstly, that it's a historical reality. And what were the historical reasons for why Jesus died on a cross? Well, it's really simple. The Jewish and Roman authorities wanted to get rid of him, right? The religious Jewish authorities were threatened by him. And the Roman authorities had no problem crucifying Jewish troublemakers or people that they believed were troublemakers, revolutionaries. So when those two forces came together, that was it for Jesus, right? The, the, he had uh, quarrels with the Jewish authorities all throughout his ministry. But as soon as they were able to partner with the evil Roman uh, authorities, suddenly Jesus was done. Right? He was arrested, he was betrayed by Judas, he was arrested and beaten and crucified. 
on that Good Friday, right? Now, this is how Peter, in Acts chapter 2, actually describes it. You see? It says, you nailed Jesus. Who's he speaking to? He's directing his, his, his voice to the Jewish authorities. He's saying, you Jewish authorities, our, our authorities, they were all Jewish, and they were saying, and he said, you nailed Jesus to a cross. But they didn't do it literally. They did it by the hands of godless men, and they put him to death. Right? So again, there it is. The Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities came together and nailed Jesus to the cross. But, even though that's the historical reasons, that's how he got onto the cross and that's how he was executed. But the real reason, the reason that they didn't know until after, was that Jesus was actually delivered over by what? The predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. It was always God's plan for that to happen. Now, I believe in freedom and I believe that God leaves much of what we do to us. But that doesn't mean God doesn't have a plan. And God doesn't predetermine things. And and he puts certain things in motion. So certainly he was working this situation out so that it would result in the death of Jesus. But we have to ask ourselves, and and I put this before you, I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago, that, that, that even that notion that God wanted Jesus to go on the cross, that's kind of strange, right? Like why would God want his son to die? It's what God understood and it's what Jesus came to understand. And that's why he submitted. It's this. It was necessary. Jesus had to die in order to accomplish what he accomplished. Right? And we're going to look at that. As a reminder, what did he accomplish by dying on the cross? Firstly, and foremostly, I think, is he set the example for us. In the way that he lived his life, And in the way that he died, Jesus set the example for us, showing us how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to live and die. We are not supposed to fight back against evil. And I already know that that there's a question in your minds, at least some of you, how much are we not supposed to fight back? Is there there wiggle room? Well, we're going to get to that. That's actually what today's message is about. But instead of fighting force with force, violence for violence, or to put it this way, evil for evil, Jesus did what? He fought back with goodness. Remember what he did on the cross? Forgive them, right? Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. So what did he demonstrate on the cross? By acting the way he did, by not fighting back. He demonstrated humility. He demonstrated compassion. He demonstrated forgiveness, as I said. And that is all wrapped up in the word love, right? That's what he demonstrated on the cross. So finally, we have a king who did not try to conquer, right? We have somebody who was in a position of authority who did not use that authority or that position for his own advantage. That's what we're going to look at today. So he set that example for us. It's so important that we... we, we, Understand that what Jesus did was set the example for us on how we're supposed to act. We are inspired by him. But there's more to it than that. Because if it was just an inspirational death, that's, that's great. Lots of people have died inspirational deaths. But there's more to it than that. Jesus was also on the cross victorious over sin, death, and evil. He conquered them. He made them have no power anymore. Sin and death and evil are still around, right? We know that all too well, but they have no more power. Do you know why? Because it's related to what I just said about the example. Jesus did not give in. He, 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 he demonstrated you don't have to give in to sin. He demonstrated that death isn't the end, right? Because God raised him from the dead. And he demonstrated that these evil rulers signified by or represented by the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities, evil rulers, though they certainly can have an effect on our lives, ultimately have no power. Why? Because God is the ultimate power. And God, through his son Jesus, has demonstrated his authority and power, not by violently conquering, not by you know, hurting anybody, but by humbly submitting and, and demonstrating goodness and love. 
So here, here are the, here's the verse that I think encapsulates that. That Jesus was victorious over sin, death, and evil. This is how Peter put it in that same passage. That God raised Jesus up again. So they put him on the cross. But it was the plan of God. And God knew this the whole time. That he was going to raise Jesus up again. And guess what that did? It put an end to the agony of death. Since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So there it is again. The power of sin and death and evil had no ultimate power over Jesus because, in fact, Jesus did not give in to it. Right? If Jesus had fought back, then he'd be like anybody else. But he didn't. He he was set apart in that way. He, He provided us an example, and he demonstrated how sin, death, and evil can be defeated. So this is how the writer of the Hebrews put it. He said... That Jesus rendered powerless him who had the power of death. That is the devil. So the devil or Satan is sort of the, the, the figurehead of everything that I'm talking about. Sin, death, and evil. The devil. Satan. The, the accuser. The adversary. Right? Jesus rendered him powerless. No more power. Again, it's kind of like, and I've talked about this as an example before. D-Day in World War II was important. It made it made it so that the Allies could win the war, right? But it wasn't V Day. That was a whole year later. Victory Day was not a, was not until a whole year later. So what's the difference? It's the fact that you can have a, a, a significant defeat of your enemy, but it might take some time for the war to be over. That's where we're, that's the era we're living in right now. That Jesus defeated evil, sin, and death. He defeated the devil. On the cross, 2,000 years ago. But the full victory doesn't come until he returns and we set up the kingdom of God. Now, we can enjoy the victory. That's the wonderful thing about the cross, is that we can enjoy the victory. In fact, we can see it as the inauguration of the kingdom of God. The launching point of the kingdom of God was the cross. Because now anybody who repents of their sin and follows after Jesus can have a place in that kingdom that Jesus is going to bring. And we can already have a a sense of it now in our lives. As much as we submit to Jesus, that's how we can have the kingdom now. And the kingdom is among us insofar as we submit to Jesus. And it's all in anticipation for when it comes in its fullness when Jesus returns. So the new creation has begun. That is... The, the amazing thing that Jesus accomplished is that the old creation, everything that is associated with sin and death and evil, that's the old creation. That's passing away. Still here, but it's passing away. Jesus brought the new creation, which is righteousness, eternal life, and God's, God himself as our king through his son Jesus. But last week, we wanted to explore what it is that we can do to use that Truth. To use the cross. What is the utility of the cross, as I put it last week? Well, we can use the cross to change. We can use the cross to see transformation in our own hearts and in our lives. We can use the cross to no longer be a part of the old creation, but to live as if we're already a part of the new creation. Put it, I put it this way. If we die with Jesus, then we can have him then live through us. As if, again, as if we're in the kingdom of God. What does that mean? How do we do that? As I said last week, making a choice. I I know I know this is like you want. We all want that magic solution to see how we see transformation in our lives, right? We would all love some some pill that we can take, like that video or or something like that, right? That would be wonderful. But the reality is, it's a choice, and we each have to choose. To, to identify with Jesus on the cross. And by that I mean we no longer live for the things that enslave us. The things that are a part of this old creation. And instead we live for Jesus. And we live, have him live through us. As if he is in us and, and controlling us. But we make that choice. So the examples I gave you. Remember? That how we can see that happen in our lives through, through our choices is... The disorganization that we have in our lives make a choice to day by day, step by step, become more organized. Right? 
the stress and anxiety that we have in our lives. Make a choice to seek out solutions. Make a choice to see how there is always a solution to every problem. Or if we're feeling down or if we're feeling pessimistic and we think there's no hope, remember there's always a bright side. And God has that bright side for us in Jesus. So we follow his example as the crucified king, the resurrected crucified king, right? Living through us. He is our example. We want to follow that example. In fact, we want to imitate Jesus on the cross. This is what I've been saying. That we identify with Jesus on the cross. We, we act as if we have died on the cross. So what does that mean? What did Jesus do? Well, I already said, he did not fight back against evil. Well, we had our, our get, connect, get Connected class this past Monday. And Paul, I hope you don't mind me mentioning that you had a question. He had a question saying, well, how far do we take that? What if we need to defend ourselves? What if we, somebody's taking advantage of us? How far do we take the humility that Jesus demonstrated on the cross? How humble do we have to be? It's a good question. I, I don't know if I have all the answers and where the parameters are, where the boundaries are. Right? I believe in self-defense. I believe in if, so, if somebody's going to come into my home and, and, and try to attack me or my family, I'm going to defend us. Right? That's, that's my opinion. I might be wrong, but that seems reasonable to me. Or if somebody's insulting me or somebody is, is uh, trying to hurt me in some way, I don't have to take that. I can walk away. I can defend myself in some other civil or, and, and righteous way, right? But here's what the cross teaches us. In everything we do, so especially in the face of evil toward us, but in everything, the attitude that we are supposed to have is one of humility. And there's things we can learn about that with Jesus on the cross and how that informs our lives. So that's what we're going to look at. And there's even a whole passage where this is all that Paul talks about. He uses Jesus on the cross to teach about humility. He said that we are to be humble like Jesus. And he, he actually put it this way. That you are to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Does that make sense? The same attitude that Christ Jesus had, especially on the cross, we are to have that same attitude. And that attitude is humility. We are to be humble as Jesus was humble, especially on the cross. In the way we think, in the way we speak, and in the way we act, we are to be humble. And Jesus demonstrated that in his life and in his death, and so we are to act that way as well. So, if you'd like to, you can follow along in Philippians chapter 2. Because we're going to look at this passage, 2 to 11. It's an important passage for us to understand. Because it's going to teach us how we can be humble. Okay, first verse there, verse 6, according to this translation, says that Jesus existed in the form of God. But he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Your translations out there might, might say, he, did, he didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped. Right? What is he saying? He's saying that even though Jesus was in the position of being the Son of God, of being God's Son, God's representative on the earth, he did not use that position of power for his own advantage. He didn't feel like he had to hold on to it and use it. Right? So Jesus had the highest position of authority. And, and here, I want, I want us to think about that. How do people in authority, especially political authority, how do they get that, that position? How do they usually get that position? I can think of at least two ways. If you're royalty, if you're a king or a queen, you inherit that position of authority, right? You don't do anything to get it. You just are born, right? It's who your parents are. It's who your, what your heritage is. Secondly, if you live in a democracy like we do, a representative type government, then you are elected, right? You're voted in. And that's, so another way to put it is you're appointed to that position of power. So to me, there is two ways that you can get power. You can either inherit it or you can be appointed to it, right? Guess what? Jesus had the best heritage you can have. God was his father, <laughs> Right? His parents were Mary and Joseph, but God was the one who brought him into existence, and God was his father. He is the son of God, and he had that position of authority as a result of that. 
And God appointed him to be the Messiah, right? God, we remember when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit came upon him. Jesus, who is the Messiah, the king of Israel, the king of the whole world. So Jesus had ultimate power, right? He, was, he inherited it as a result of, of, his, of his, where he came from and also the fact that God appointed him to that position. So God, Jesus could have used that power for his own advantage. Again, to be in the form of God means you are representing God on this earth. It's kind of like saying in the image of God. It's that those two words are really related. And so it's clarified right there in the text. It says that he did not use that equality with God, being equal to God's position. He did not use it for his own advantage. Right? What does this tell us? This tells us that power is fine, but we must never abuse it. We must never misuse power to take advantage of others or to take advantage uh, of others for our own sake. Right? N.T. Wright said, and I, I know I've been quoting a lot from that, that book, but I found one quote that I really enjoyed about this passage. He said that the first half of this poem, the part we just looked at, is Jesus' refusal to do what people normally do. And that is to exploit your status or your power for your own benefit. Everybody, I don't care who you are, Everybody is tempted to use power for your own benefit, right? Like if you're in any sort of position of authority, whether it's political or you're just a boss at work or you're a teacher, whatever it might be, right? You're tempted to use that for your own advantage. <laughs> Jerry and Eleanor are laughing back there. It, it, I'm not saying we always give into it, but, but we certainly are tempted to use that for our own advantage, and Jesus had the most power, the best position, the best status, and he did not use that. So, we can learn that we should, shouldn't use power and status to our own advantage, especially if it's at the expense of others. But then look what Paul said. Instead of doing that, that Jesus received the form of a slave. So he was in the form of God. He was God's son, right? But he received the form of a slave. He was indeed born in the likeness of, of human beings. He was a human being. And he had human appearance. To everybody else, he just looked like any other Israelite, right? Any other Jewish guy. And he had that appearance. He experienced humanity as we do. He was a genuine human being. But he humbled himself and became obedient even to death. Yes, even the death of the cross. So when God brought his son into the world, and we believe that, we celebrate that every year, and we believe that God brought his son into the world through the Virgin Mary, he did it to Jewish peasants living in the Middle East, living in Israel, at a time when they were occupied by evil foreigners, the Romans. Right? Right? You think when God is going to bring his son into the world, he's going to bring him in grand fashion. He's going to bring him into a high position, a royal family or a rich family, right? But what's the story of Christmas, right, that we celebrate every year? Born in a, in, in a humble location, placed in a manger, you know, surrounded by shepherds and, and animals. That's the son of God. Why? To demonstrate that the Messiah, the King, the crucified King, did not come to be, as he said, he did not come to be served, but to serve. Right? What does that teach us? We are to have that same attitude of humility. He humbled himself to fully identify with us, to be our representative. Right? He is God's representative, but he's also our representative. That's the beautiful thing about the Messiah, being the Son of God. He represents God to us, and he represents us to God. And he did that so that we can be like him. So that he can lead the way out of the old creation and lead the way into the new creation. So how do we do that? How do we live humbly ourselves, right? How can we actually make a choice, once again, 
to no longer be enslaved by the things that, that keep us slaves to sin. And instead make a choice and be a part of the new creation, have Jesus, the Messiah, living through us. And how can we do that? How can we make that choice? It, it means living humbly. It means humility. But here's some actual things we can do. Be open to learning from others. If you want to live humbly, if you want to have the same attitude that Jesus had, be open to learning from others. In fact, one of the books I'm reading in preparation for A Sound Mind, that, that upcoming sermon series, is uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. And one of his rules is always assume that the person that you're talking to has something for you to learn, will say something that you need to learn. Always assume that. Even if you normally consider that person to be an idiot. <laughs> assume that you're going to learn something from them, right? Why? Because that's the humble attitude that we should have to realize we don't know everything, right? We haven't experienced everything. We don't have all knowledge. So always assume that there's something for you to learn, especially when you're talking with others. In fact, this is what Paul said in that passage in Philippians 2. That as God's people, as people who are supposed to have the attitude of Jesus, we are to bring our thinking into line with one another, right? But how do we bring our thinking into line with one another if we're not humble? If we're not open to learning from others? If we're not open to hearing what others have to say and, and, and maybe even embracing that? So we can only get on the same page if we listen humbly to others, and genuinely be open to their viewpoints. Now, when I'm saying that, I'm thinking of our church setting, right? As we speak to one another. But think of your spouse. <laughs> think of your kids. Think of anybody in your life that maybe normally you don't really listen to. You do a lot of the talking to them, but you don't really listen to them. Right? Take a moment, as the scripture says, be slow to speak and listen. You might learn something. I might learn something. Boy, I'm talking right now. I want to hear what you guys have to say. Right? So be open to learning from others. But what this passage about in Philippians also teaches us is we shouldn't abuse power. And that's related to... So the first one has a, a, a next step on your connection card. You can check that off, right? But this also is a next step you can take. To treat those whom you are over, whom you have power over, treat them well. You know, uh, you don't want to abuse your power. In fact, you know, you, you know that saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it goes back to what I was saying, that we're all tempted by power, right? In fact, there's a, there's a uh, who here has watched The Office? It's a really, really funny show. But this is the character Dwight. And he always wanted to be the, the, the manager of, the, of, their, of their office. And for one day, he, gets, he finally becomes the manager for a day. And he totally abuses his power. And so Jim, the, his co-worker, says, I've never seen, this is the smallest amount of power I've ever seen go to somebody's head. <laughs> have you ever been around people and they have like the littlest power that you can imagine and they're totally abusing it? It's like, come on, you know. We're supposed to be people who, no matter what kind of power we have over others, we don't abuse that power, right? That's primarily, I think, how, to answer Paul's question, and not fully, but in a way that hopefully we can think about and, and continue to learn, is that the way we're supposed to imitate Jesus is to simply not use our power for our own advantage against others. That... So that doesn't really speak to defense, right? That's something maybe different. But when we're in a situation where we do have power and we could use it to our advantage, we make a choice not to. So what did Paul say about that? This is how we do it. We simply, it's to regard everybody else as your superior, right? Regard everybody else as your superior. That's Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. So if you have power over others, then the way you can actually treat them well is by think, just imagining and assuming that actually they're your superior, that you have to serve them. And that doesn't mean that you give up your power. Jesus never gave up his power, right? It just means that you don't use it to your advantage. It's completely revolutionary. What Jesus did on the cross 
was completely revolutionary. Nobody does that. And nobody really has since, except for those of us who are trying to follow in his footsteps. To not use power for our own advantage, but to treat others well. And lastly, if we're going to be humble like Jesus was humble, we we have to care about the bigger picture. Now, I'm an individualist. I believe everybody's an individual and everybody has individual rights. But we should be caring about the bigger picture, how it affects everybody, right? Why did Jesus do what he did for himself? Well, in a sense, like as a result of what he did, he was going to be the, 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 uh, the elevated, resurrected Messiah. Wonderful for him. But he did it for us, right? As we looked at a couple weeks ago, Jesus died for our sins, died in our place, if you will. So he did it because he knew of the bigger picture. So Jesus had this in mind, as Paul said, to not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And that's our memory verse for the week, right? Do not merely look out for the personal interests of yourself, but for the interests of others. Caring about the bigger picture, the ultimate goal. It means you don't always get exactly your way, right? And again, obviously, as your pastor, I'm always thinking about our church and about how we get along and all that. But think about your relationships, right? If you want to have a happy and healthy marriage, a happy and healthy family or work situation, then sometimes you have to care about the bigger picture and not totally get exactly what you want, right? You have to negotiate. You have to figure things out. When, when you go to work, you're not working purely for yourself. You're working for the goal of whatever it is you guys do, right? Same in a family. Same in a church. You care about the big picture. And that keeps you humble because, again, you don't always get exactly what you want. But here's the, hum- the, the, the thing about the humility of the cross is that we don't do it just because it's the right thing to do. That's wonderful. It is the right thing to do. It's what Jesus did, and we should be doing it too. We will have a better world if we are humble. I guarantee it. If you want a better life, and if you want a better world, try try some humility. I guarantee you it'll help. But there is more than that. There is the reward for humility. Demonstrating humility will bring us incredible reward. Why? What did Jesus say? Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And how do we know that that's true? How do we know that if we do indeed make that choice to humble ourselves, like, like Jesus humbled himself, that we will receive great reward and be exalted? How do we know? Because that's what happened to Jesus. The rest of that passage, and let's have Sarah come as we're going to sing this next song, this wonderful song, The Potter's Hand. If you want to be rewarded or, or, or want to see that reward of humility, just look at what happened to Jesus. He humbled himself as humbled as you could possibly be, right? Humbled that anybody else could be. And yet, then God raised him from the dead. He highly exalted him. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what that means? Even though Jesus was humbled to the lowest point, he has now been raised to the highest point. And we can expect that as well. Because the whole idea is that we are dying with Jesus and we want to live for him and through and with him and have him live through us. But as I've already said and I will keep on saying, we have to choose it. We have to choose to be his, to, to have that be a reality in our lives. God will help us and God will empower us, but we have to choose it. This song, The Potter's Hand, allows us to sing that confession, to sing that decision. So let's sing it together.